Welcome to How to Attain Knowledge of Higher Worlds, the Akasha series. I'm thrilled today because again, we are doing something so new with a whiteboard and we're going to use a magic word that most people don't know what it means to enter in to look at some cosmic subjects. So welcome initiates, welcome to this broadcast today. I assume all of you are initiates, all of you have uh, done the preparation to reach that stage of uh, what we call enlightenment where you start to literally see lights, hear sounds, and experience rays or basically communications with higher beings. And that's when the whole dialogue of the spirit starts. And that's what Akash is all about. That's what this series is all about. And today we're going to talk about exomatosis. Now, I never knew what this word was, and I never had any idea about it, even though I had done it <laughs> for um, a long, long time, uh, until I came across Daskalus, this wonderful Christian Cyprian teacher who's a healer, one of the best healers. I'll tell you a few stories about him because we were trained, Tyler and myself, we're trained in um, uh, Paul Scorpion's version of what Daskalus, this wonderful great healer that even Rudolf Steiner referred to, uh, was teaching. Now, Daskalus is just means uh, basically teacher in Cyprian. He's a Cypriot. And his real name is Dr. Stilianos. Ateshlis. Now, I don't say that properly because I, though I've been to Greece a few times, can't speak a word of it no matter how hard I try. But anyway, Daskalus, if you get his books, and by the way, they're just marvelous. I ran across this many, many, many years ago when I was young. It's called The Magus of Strovolos, and I read it and thought, oh, that's fantastic. Then I didn't know that, that uh, Daskalus has some books himself. This is one of them, The Esoteric Teachings, A Christian Approach to Truth by... Dr. Stilianos Atishlis, and these were great. This agrees with Rudolf Steiner in so many ways. Now, what is it that this word means, and why was Daskalus doing exomatosis? Ah, that is the threshold into going into one of my favorite presentations, which seems as if it's a simple question whose answer is quite complicated, but once you understand it, it then becomes the simplest thing for a cosmology, a Christian cosmology, that is more pervasive than practically any one that you can find anywhere else. And here it is in one simple picture on the board. Now, this is a very deceiving picture. I want to say that from the beginning. This is really the way it looks like, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. If we were to say, uh, from a geocentric position, here you are lying in your bed asleep at night, you're on the Earth, and then this goes out to the realm of the Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, three times through the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. You'll often see me use these sigils for the planets, but they're the same ones that you'll find in any cosm cosmological picture that I put upon the board. It's just, um, it's a frame of reference. It's something to hang your hat on. It's a way to look at it. Is it correct? No. No chart is correct that is describing higher beings because we can barely understand the very first rung of what it would be like to be a moon being or a Mercury being or a Venus being or so on and so forth, an angel, an archangel, an archai. So this is simply a diagrammatic representation which is certainly inadequate. But I put over here so that you would know that these sigils, planetary sigils often used in astrology, uh, are talking about these layers here, Earth, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, three times through the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then when you get beyond that, you're in the Zodiac, and if you go below the Earth realm, you get into the realm of the elementals. Now again, why would we stack them up that way? Why would we use uh, the approach of Tycho de Brahe? Uh, or, you know, or, or Kepler, or Galileo, or anyone, when in fact we know now that this is the truth over here. So I gotta mention this before we get started so that you don't think I'm an imbecile. Uh, because now anyone who thinks that this, if we put the sun here and the planets around it, to think that this would be, you know, geocentric or heliocentric or what is correct, that's all wrong. Have they changed any of the textbooks? No. But to get to exomatosis, which I'll be describing in a minute, we need to understand what it means to travel through these realms at night when you're asleep, because if you don't know what that means, you don't really have a cosmology, and you don't know where you go when you die, and what happens to you when you die, because every sleep is a small death. 
of course, uh, death uh, has a sister, and that sister is sleep. So let's just talk for a second about something that is a little bit out in the woods. Before, uh, we're not talking about eczematosis, but this is absolutely important. They took all of the computer analysis that they have in every single domain, and they mapped out what is the true motion of the sun and the planets. It has nothing to do with anything like this. It actually, in fact, looks like a helix. It looks like a DNA when you look at it in, from one way. And the sun is here, as I have it pictured here, going towards, of course, the fixed star Vega in the constellation uh, Lyra. And then you have the three inner planets, the Earth, uh, Mercury, and Venus, in a close lemniscate, a figure eight right behind the sun being pulled by the sun, as we've talked about in other pro presentations, and then in a larger one, and though I, I didn't know how to draw this, this would have to be 90 degrees adjacent to this one, and twice as big. And these are the outer planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And the reason that this works is because if you look at the uh, mathematics for degenerative Cassini curves, that is really what's happening. To think that we're in an ellipse is nothing more than a mathematical transposition. We are not. We are being pulled behind the sun, and we are following a limnoscate, and the outer planets are in another limnoscate, 90 degrees adjacent to us, and the outer three, what we call planets, which really aren't and aren't part of our solar system, our solar system ends with Saturn, and that's the reason here in this picture, it ends in Saturn. These, uh, you know, uh, Uranus, uh, and Neptune, and Pluto, uh, according to Rudolf Steiner, came to us as planetoids that were just drawn into our system. So if you look closely, whether it is in the cosmos or in the human system, the DNA, you're going to see the same exact form. It's the form of DNA. Now, we are moving 43,000 miles an hour in that pattern behind the sun in our local solar system. Then you have to add the galactic center and the supergalactic center, which makes us moving over 663,000 miles an hour standing on the Earth. So it is a rather complicated system. Now, that's really what's happening, but that's not the way that I'm going to picture it now. So for those, I'm going to try to save you from having to make a remark saying <laughs> that's not the way it really is. Okay, so if we look at this as a geocentric picture, you go to sleep at night. You have, and this will be something that eventually I will stop writing on the board, you have a physical body, an etheric body, the body of life, which keeps the physical body alive. You have an astral body, and then you have the ego, which can go between all of them and can actually go up into three higher realms where there's three other spirit realms which the ego can attain, but we haven't attained that much as a human being right now. So what happens? You got these four bodies. When you go to sleep at night, these two go up and out, and that's what I'm trying to describe here. So let's up and out. It goes out in all directions at once. These two, your ego and your astral body. What happens to the physical and the etheric? They stay here, and your blood pressure calms down. Your heartbeat and your breath turns into a beautiful hexameter rhythm, basically, uh, four to one. As your perfect balance between breath and heart is attained at four to one, you go into a sleep that is regenerative. So your etheric body becomes very active at night when you're asleep, and it, in fact, regenerates the physical body every night. When you wake up and your ego drops down into your physical body and you wake up, because there's waking, sleeping, dreamless sleep, trans consciousness, we'll come back to that in a minute. But it's the reason I put it up here so I can say, when you come out of your sleeping condition into a waking condition, what happens? The ego drops down into the physical, etheric, and astral. But when it does, it starts to eat it up alive. It starts to consume it. <laughs> because that's the nature of the ego. The ego is, its life is um, arrived at by suppressing the power of your own desire body and or working with your desire body so that your desires, intents, wishes 
all those things, even your lusts and your vices, all in the astral body can either be controlled by the ego or not. But in the daytime, we're mostly up here following our desire body, and the etheric body is not re-enlivening the physical body. It is, in fact, being worn out by these two usurpers who come into the daytime and wear these two out. So at night when we sleep, imagine, this is absolutely just for pictorial imagination, that and this is, of course, two-dimensional of a three-dimensional process, which is actually four, fifth, sixth, and seventh dimensional. But we will just describe this now. Here, this is the symbol for the Earth. So you're lying on your bed at night and you're sleeping. Your astral body and your ego go out. They don't go all the way out. Okay. Now, I'm not going to get into the technical details of that, exactly which organs, which glands, the nerve process, and where... Parts of the ego and astral remain in your body at night when you're sleeping, and parts, most, most of the parts of these two go out. Okay, so what happens? Well, you start to expand. Imagine this is an onion, and, and just like, um, you know, um, uh, an onion has layers. This ha we're going to imagine this has layers. So imagine you're lying in your bed. You go to sleep, and you go out to the crown, and you start to expand in all directions at once. Now, that's not what we normally experience. And as I told you in our last talk, I think, in the last couple talks, especially the last one with John Barnwell, waking up in these realms is not a pleasant experience unless you are well prepared and you have done the preparation for the enlightenment that must be inside of you to be able to experience these moral realms. And if you have no morality, you can't experience them. And what happens when you're asleep? Nothing. What happens to an initiate when they're asleep? Rudolf Steiner said, an initiate does not sleep at night for knowing of the suffering of the world. Rudolf Steiner only slept three, four hours a night on the nights that he did sleep and produced more work than anyone you can shake a stick at. He is, his work is unbelievably prolific, you know, over 350 books, on and on and on. So, what is an initiate doing at night? Well, let's talk about what the normal person does at night first. And then we'll get to what the initiate does, which is exomatosis. Let me just say it now so you don't have to wait. Exomatosis means you exit the body and you go out and you matosis. You, this is a word I believe that he made up. And you merge with other spiritual beings at night. And just as Rudolf Steiner said, there may be only 48 people on the earth at this moment that understand these spiritual concepts, but that's what holds the earth together. So where do they meet? He said that at least a few of those groups meet when they're asleep. They meet in the etheric realm, the pure realm of Shambhala, the etheric realm. But because they prepared themselves and they have enlightened themselves, they've learned to use imagination, this first step of initiation. Imagination, which is higher than enlightenment, by the way. Uh, and it's actually the second step. It's, well, I don't have it up here on the board, but... I put it up on the last presentation. Spirit, self, life, spirit, spirit, man. Those are the three higher parts of the human being that we will attain in the future. And that's where the initiates go. They go into that realm and they are talking with angelic beings, higher beings, saints. They go into the temple of Sophia. And that's why our book on the Gospel of Sophia is all about the Temple of Sophia. How do they get through it? Through the pillars of the virtues, because that's what holds up the temple or the virtues. And there they imbibe in wisdom. They teach and they're taught. And in most cases, anyone who is an initiate who is having these type of dreams come back and tell you they are so nourished by it. It's like they drank Soma. They drank Amrita. They drank the, the Dew of Heaven. They drank the Elixir of Immortality, right? That's what happens. If you're sleeping right, as you're going into these realms, which are actually ruled right here, the, the moon by the angels, the mercury by the archangels, Venus by the archai, as you're going and expanding out into these realms, if you have something to feed them, because you've had good thinking, feeling, and willing in the daytime, thinking, feeling, willing, and I'll go into why I describe them up here at the board in that way, but if you have good thinking, feeling, and willing, that becomes moral thinking or imagination, moral feeling or inspiration, moral willing or intuition. You feed the gods in these realms as you expand outwards at night into their realms, pictorially speaking. Okay? Well, that's just about all that most human beings could handle. But let's say that you're a very highly developed person. And by the way, 
Materialism keeps you down in the realm between the earth and the moon. You don't even get to the realm of the moon. If you're a materialist and you only believe in science and every uh, stupid superstition they tell you, which is really, uh, it's just a new pope. You know, science is just the new Vatican. If you believe in that stuff, you don't take any gifts to the angels at night between the earth and the moon, and you're in the realm of what's called the um, howling demons. And basically, when you listen to all the beings who are locked into the realm between the earth and the moon, you hear screaming and yelling and crying. And an initiate at night goes to those beings when they are only in their ego and astral body and can serve some of those beings who still have free will. Now, they don't go, an initiate doesn't go through exomatosis to help people who no longer have free will. What would be the point? But for the people who have free will who may be sick, who may uh, need spiritual guidance, who may need literally, literally a prayer group cast around them at night to pray for them, world leaders, other beings, this is quite common. And when you talk to a high initiate, they will tell you that sometimes they're, you know, they're a little bit tired because at night they're so busy because they're invited when they go to sleep because they've digested their thinking, feeling, and willing that happened in the daytime before they went to sleep. And then in these realms of dreaming, dreamless sleep, and trance consciousness, they become awake and they get to help other beings or work on themselves. And that is also going into these other higher spiritual realms, which we would say are the signs of Buddhahood or Christ and uh, Christ and na nature. So, every night that we sleep, we have a practice of what's going to happen to us when we die. When you die and when you sleep, it's the same thing. And if you can meditate utterly profoundly and you can get your concentration and contemplation level up and you can prepare yourself for enlightenment and then you start to have these moments where the spiritual world starts to manifest to you in light and sound and in speech, you could call it rays, uh, then you yourself can start to go into these realms consciously while you're awake in meditation. You can literally go into these realms and ask questions in a completely awake mind, not in a trance consciousness, and not in a dreaming or a dreamless sleep, no, in a waking consciousness. Because in between the physical and the spiritual, P for physical, S for spiritual, is the threshold. And this threshold is the thing that we're going to talk about that soon when we talk about doppelgangers. But this threshold will push back anything you're trying to bring into the spiritual world that isn't spiritual. Very simple. Same thing happens when you die. For instance, when you die, for the first few days, you are, your, your etheric body, well, your astral body is unwinding, but your etheric body is, is unwinding, and you basically see your whole life in a period of about three days going backwards from the point of view of everyone that you ever encountered. Not from your own selfish perspective, but from the perspective of the other person and how you affected them and how that affected karma. And that's why we always say, when I die, I'm going to get to know everything. You're going to get to know about the karma of what you've done. Yes, you will get to know everything you did and the effect that it had. Yes, that is correct. Can that happen at night? Yes, and it does. If you don't say your prayers, if you don't meditate, if you don't do the rakshaw, the going backwards in the day to remember what you did in relationship to other people and the karma that you created or the karma you alleviated, if you don't do that every single night, you take garbage into the spiritual world. Because when you're asleep, you're in the spiritual world. You're in the same world you'll, you came from before you were born, that you go to sleep in and that you live in after death. And you go out after death to the realm of Saturn through seven year, well, through certain periods of time. Okay, I won't go into all of that. May, that would be a great talk, though, someday if there was one word that related to this going out and coming back. But if you, if this was seen as a human dying, then you go out through these realms and everything you did in, for the realm of the moon, and it's all your emotions, all your astral body, all your etheric body all your physical body, all the things you did, all the good and bad things written right there into the Akasha, into the memory body of space, 
which is the ultimate ether, the mother of all the ethers. And as you go out, you either feed the gods or you don't. If you feed them, they feed you. So it is a, a reciprocal relationship that anyone who's spiritual that has done these things will say, well, I do it because it regenerates me, because I come back enlivened, seeing the synchronicity in my life, seeing the way that uh, life is is not just an accident, seeing that there's divine order, seeing that there's uh, a, a, far beyond artificial intelligence or human intelligence is the intelligence of the cosmos, which is a natural intelligence, which once it comes down to the realm of the earth, it has to use our rules. But once you start to go out to these realms, we're not using the same rules anymore. And as I said, Rudolf Steiner said, if you're standing on the rings of Saturn, and you're looking out of the zodiac at the fixed stars, guess what? No human mind can comprehend anything beyond that realm. <laughs> the human mind cannot comprehend anything beyond our solar system. Now this was recently, and this, is, uh, this was said by Rudolf Steiner, who predicted exactly where the galactic center was, the first one to predict it, where the supergalactic center was, uh, that the sun is a white hole. All of these things have now been proven, that light can move faster than the frontal mo uh, measured frontal speed of light, uh, that the center of mass of, the, of our solar system wasn't on the sun. It's in a dynamic position in between the inner and outer planets in relationship to the sun right there. It's not on the sun. That goes against everything that, you know, Newtonian physics would tell us. So Rudolf Steiner is the greatest astrophysicist of all times. And he told us not only the true motion of the planets, and he described this in great detail and mathematically showed that it could be proven that it was true, just as true as uh, what we have as the general mathematics, which are only approximations, by the way. So as we're going out into these realms, this is about as far as a human can really get in terms of most people today. Some people, as I say, can't even get out to the realm of the moon because they're materialists. They live in a dark realm where thinking is dead. It's shadow gray thoughts. They live in a web, a spider web of mythology, superstition, and uh, papal encyclicals from the scientific world, which change, by the way, every day. But you're supposed to be up to date on all of it. It's just like the laws of the land. You must know all laws of the land. <laughs> Somehow, you magically, you're supposed to know that. And you're now supposed to know uh, all these laws. And when Anthroposophists get together, or Rudolf Steiner starts the lecture, he says, As you know, in ancient Saturn, Sun, Moon, da, 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 he'll, he'll give this little first sentence where you go, What does any of that mean? But once you get a cosmology, then it all makes sense. So, once you get to this realm, this is the realm of the sun because it's so much more powerful. You go through this realm three times, even at night when you sleep, if you can get through there, even after death. Three times it takes to get through the realm of the sun. And these have beings in them. And your relationship to that when you're asleep or after death has to do with you, whether you've communed with them, whether you've had a language of the Spirit, you've talked with them, whether you imagine them, whether you pray with them, whether they're your friends, whether they help you, whether you look for them to guidance, on and on and on. But this is where the realm of Christ is, this realm here. And then there's the realm of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So once you get through these, then you go out to here. So this is seven-year cycles. So when you're born to the moon is seven, 14, 21, 28, 35, 42, uh, 49, 56, 63. So when you're 63 and you're standing on the rings of Saturn and you've completed these nine realms, we talked about the nine realms in the last talk. When you completed this nine cycle and you're standing in the realms of Saturn, you have to say, well, what shall I do? Shall I turn around and go back? And if I do, what do I bring back with me? That's true every night you sleep. Can most people get out to this realm? No, they're not initiates. They can't get past the realm of the sun, most of them. And some of them can't get past these inner realms. Some can't get past the realm of the moon. But if you could go out to the realm of Saturn and you were an initiate, when you did, because you could go there very quickly instead of having to go through everything you did 
that day with other people that caused karma so that you could try to resolve the karma before you went to sleep at night. So if you could do that and you got out here, then you could say, hey, spiritual world, starry fixed heavens, the zodiac, the hierarchy, I have some extra energy here and I'm not limited by a physical body. How can I help? And they will put you to work. And that's what exomatosis is. And um, I know this to be true from direct experience. And I know many people who have done this and have done it throughout their whole life because they really didn't have much of a choice. They were invited and they were nice people who invited you, nice beings, so you went with them. <laughs> and you saw the next day in the newspaper that yes, some things changed or some things happened or some things were mitigated or so on and so forth. Or you just know that certain things were changed by people at night. Now, we're welcoming you here into our, into our um, what we call our biosphere. This is our bioatmosphere where we keep out the rest of the world and we keep in the good energy. We wrote about it in a story called the Bio Arc of the North. That's your body, folks. That's you. But you need to extend that in your art of living to your whole house. And then you need to extend it into the realm of moon, Mercury, Venus, all the way to all these things. Those are all you. Saturn is part of you. Uh, Mars is your gallbladder. Uh, Jupiter is your liver. Saturn is your spleen. Those things aren't far out there. They're right in here. And they're very simply accessible to those who can wake up at night and start to listen. Well, first, strangely enough, I will usually say light, sound, and rays. But it usually appears sound, light, and rays. So when you're at night in your sleep and you start to hear things and you come back the next day, oftentimes you'll, you will, will have been told something with words, right? Those are rays. You might have seen pictures. Well, dreams, you're going to see a lot of pictures, right? Uh, so that's the light. But when you start to speak with them, when that sound starts to happen, Rudolf Steiner calls that inspiration. Those are archangel beings. They're the beings of speech, the beings who control the different folk souls for the different nations. They start speaking to you, and you can ask questions and get answers. And so this is not a passive game of, oh, I'm going to uh, do the stages that it takes in the Lamrin or the Lojang for, or Knowledge of Higher Worlds for Enlightenment. Or how do I attain how, Knowledge of Higher Worlds? Well, I study Rudolf Steiner's books, Knowledge of Higher Worlds of the, and, the, uh, and its attainment. And you start to wake up in the daytime to know some of this and experience it. And you certainly start to wake up at night. Now, don't be discouraged if you don't have dreams. Don't be discouraged if your dreams are over vivid. Don't be discouraged if your dreams don't have colors. Don't be discouraged if you can't do what good old Don Carlos taught uh, uh, Carlos Castaneda to do. In your dreams, wake up by looking at the palms of your hands. Remember? That was the big teaching for all of Carlos Castaneda. In your dreams, when you think that you'd like to get control of them, Look at your hands. And from that moment on, you have some control of your dreams. Uh, so don't be worried about all of that. Dreams take cycles. They go through cycles. Sometimes they're uh, uh, feeding you uh, and you don't know it. Sometimes you're feeding the spiritual world. You don't know it. But sometimes you'll have a cloud of fragrance come and surround you like a dream where you go, oh, no, this can't be real. This is otherworldly. I know that I'm smelling right now a certain flower, but I'm not because there's no such thing. Not in this house, not anywhere near here. Well, that's the same thing. So when we talk about rays, we're talking basically about things that are about the level of fragrance, uh, which then you can literally be, think of it, smell your smell of favorite fragrance and it can take you back to a time in your life where you literally have endless memory, endless memory from one smell, for one nanosecond. So that's what happens when you go into the spiritual world. That's what happens when you go into this realm consciously and you can do some exomatosis. Now let me just mention a couple things. Uh, I went past this very, very quickly, but I'll just highlight it. We have the waking state. Now that doesn't mean you don't have a super conscious state, because there are. And that's what I mentioned when I said there's these three higher spiritual states of the human ego above the you know what we see in the physical world there are higher states uh, so there's higher states in waking but when you go to sleep at night what's the first thing that happens 
R-E-M. So you start to look at everything that you saw in the daytime, the muscles of your eyes go through rapid eye movement and they basically try to digest everything that you experience. In other words, it's like a reliving the memory of it. But strangely enough, it goes into reverse order. So it's like the muscles relaxing and you are seeing and looking everywhere. They've done tons of studies on this and they can literally, they put people through these uh, see, seeing things for the day and what they saw, then they track their uh, motion of the muscles of their eyes at night. And literally, when they're looking up at the trees, uh, their eyes are looking up, and they literally can track it back so that it is a literally a proportional measure of your day. Is it, it can be tracked through the muscular relaxation of your eyes? So some people think those are dreams. Those aren't dreams. That's digesting your day. And then, of course, depending on what you ate beforehand, if you ate anywhere before you, you go to sleep, then you're going to have, you could just be having digestive dreams, okay? But if you can get past, when you go to sleep, when you go past this threshold, and the guardian of the threshold is there between the physical and the spiritual world, when you do that, I challenge you to try to wake up at the moment that you're going to sleep. Go ahead, try that. Wake up, stay awake at the moment that you fall asleep. Where is it you go? Where's your consciousness at that moment? What happens to your consciousness? And if you're awake in your dreams, then why aren't you awake when you cross the threshold to go into your dreams? You see, these are the mysteries of the threshold. We can't take our garbage into the spiritual world. We can't take that stuff. We have to go there and for the first section of sleep, through rapid eye movement, we have to digest everything your eye looked at. Well, don't you think you also digest everything you heard? How about everything you did? So how about the muscles of your body? If you were out helping people with your body, wouldn't that also be a memory that you would experience when you went to sleep? Yes, it would, of course. And then a lot of the sleep, a lot of the dreams that we have are right before we awaken because we're actually mixing waking um, sensory impressions with dream impressions, and they're complete nonsense. So when you go back to try to remember those dreams you had right before you woke, if it wasn't a continuing dream, or a precognitive dream, or a dream, a repetitive dream, then it's probably a, a physiological dream of you just reacting to your physical body. But if you can go into dreamless sleep, that's where your body is rejuvenated. And Rudolf Steiner calls them these. That's his names. Dreamless sleep. When you go into dreamless sleep, your body's rejuvenated. If you don't go into dreamless sleep when you're asleep, you go insane. And if you become an insomniac who never sleeps, well, I know a few. They're not normal people, okay? Sleep is the panacea for all of this toxin we take in, take in down into the, in the physical earth. And if we do not go into that realm and get rejuvenated, then you will, your ego will become imbalanced. Trans consciousness. Now, this is the part that's somewhat interesting. This is when you hypnotize someone or you go into the unconscious, the subconscious, the collective conscious. Well, that's super smart. Sometimes you can hypnotize someone or put them in trance or through um, their own uh, autosuggestive trance uh, or a, a cataleptic uh, state, and you can learn all kinds of things. You can learn physical facts from those people because they are super open and receptive. So do we have all those? Yes, but where are they? They're down in trance consciousness. So the last thing you want to do is to be hanging out with somebody who's channeling somebody when they're in a trance induced consciousness because you have no idea who's coming in because there's the subconscious the unconscious the color anything could come in you don't want to use trance to go into the spiritual world so when you're in trance when you're in sleep you're in this super deep state of of egolessness of selflessness that uh, is used to contact these other realms so then we also want to make certain that you know that thinking, feeling, and willing, these three things that are part of your soul, your soul, and you can also say thinking, feeling, and willing, your head, your heart, and your hands, or your willpower, your metabolic system. So thinking, feeling, and willing, these three things are transformed into higher forms of themselves and go into these spiritual realms. But when we're thinking normally, it's with waking consciousness. You're not thinking when you're dreaming. Most of the time you aren't controlling your dreams unless you're an initiate or an aspiring initiate. And so what, what do you have here? When you go into your feeling, you are dreaming. 
Now this really shakes up some people. Your feelings are dreams, okay? Now a feeling is always what? It's always sympathy or antipathy. It's either towards or away from, right? Towards or away from, always sympathy or antipathy, always, you know, a like, dislike, all this stuff. Feelings are different than love. Love comes out of the will. But the feelings are dreams. And so most of the time, when you're having a feeling, and people don't understand that feelings are more powerful than thoughts, that's why depression can take over your body and turn it into absolute um, uh, rigor mortis. It can, it, it can freeze your body so you can't do anything. It takes over your willpower, right? So, in feelings, we're dreaming. But, oh no, you don't want to tell certain people that their feelings are just dreams. No, what you need to remember is that if you're going to go that direction, you need to point out that Rudolf Steiner says that the only thing you remember from one human incarnation to the next, repeated human incarnations, is what you dream at night. Now that is a mysterious thing. I've brought this um, statement up to all kinds of spiritual teachers and anthroposophists and so on, and no one seems to be able to uh, quite grok it, quite understand it. So what does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? Well, what he really means by that, and he only says it in one place, is it's what you have digested in your dreams at night. Because what is it you're digesting in your dreams at night? Karma. Destiny. Whether you've loved, been loved, whether you've had charity, whether you've had grace, whether you've had beauty, those are the very things that are eternal and go past the threshold into the spiritual world and feed the beings in these realms at night. And if you're doing that, you should know it, you see? And so when you say, oh, feelings are just dreams, no. Feelings are so powerful that they are dreams, and dreams are so powerful that they can help you digest things that you as a human can't digest. In other words, spiritual beings are coming to you at night and helping you digest in your sleep things that you can't. And so you can talk to people all you want, and some people have had lots of dreams, other people have had never a dream, nary a dream in their life. I've known numerous people who came to me and said they wanted to dream. So I said, take a double terminated crystal, put it within three feet of your head, and you will dream, and they usually do. Why is that? Because your head is where we deposit silica, calcium carbonate crystals, and many other crystals, all kinds of things from uh, cesium to iridium to you name it. Uh, so when this crystallization process happens and we start to deposit them in the head, uh, then the human head becomes um, piezoelectric, and it, the silica is piezoelectric. So simply put, a double terminated crystal is a broadcaster and receiver antenna. And so is our pineal gland. But most people's pineal glands are calcified because of so much fluoride in the water and the horrible food and so on and so forth. So anyway, this is what I wanted to bring to you today. This is exomatosis. So folks, before you go to sleep, do your rukshaw, do your review of the day backwards from the other people's point of view, not your point of view. Do your homework before you go into sleep, and then you will get some control of your dreams, and you'll be able to go into these realms, and eventually you'll be able to go in asking questions of, you actually ask it of Saturn, and then in the morning you listen from the moon and you literally get answers, sometimes even with spoken words, images, inspirations. You get this soma that I'm talking about. And that is, as you know, when you have an inspiration, it feels as if you just imbibe something that is absolutely nutritional for your soul and spirit. Well, that's what this is. So use it to your advantage. And when the time comes that you're doing some exomatosis, Tyler and I will see you out there.